and watching the year come to a close and thinking about, well, several things that, that come to mind really. It's uh, one thing is how the year just is so predictable that December is going to be the busiest month, the most stress-filled month, the, the most expensive month. Uh, I don't know. Um, so much gets packed in. And for me, even more because before this month ends, I'm going away. I'm heading down to Costa Rica to start next year from there um, and leave my wife and daughter here for two months on their own. Um, so there's a fantastic amount I have to get done for them before I go as much as possible, get things, you know, get things right for them and set for them so that I can comfortably leave. Uh, and even then I can't ever comfortably leave. I'm just not that guy. Um, I think it's because my dad used to tell me that there was, there was two things that he wouldn't do for money. He wouldn't, he wouldn't kill for money and, and he wouldn't work away from home for money. And, and I'm willing to work away from home a little bit. I don't, you know, I don't think my, because I work from home, he worked, you know, he worked in an office nine to five and, and, uh, and I'm home working from home. So I'm a lot more with my family than the average guy anyway. All of that leads into, I want next year to be a great success. How about you? You want next year to be a success? Raise your hand. A success for you. Rachel, I was talking about you today to a friend of mine and saying how you're, you're on track. You know, you've made some goals and realized like living on the very, very edge of a disaster really doesn't leave you any room for the disaster. <laughs> and, and that, you know, you're taking the appropriate steps so that it doesn't happen again. And, and, and you build yourself a little bit of a cushion of health and fitness um, <clears throat> so that all things go right. And, and you know, I was talking with Larissa saying, all the years that it took me to finally figure out how to be 100% raw. And partly there was no model. There was no working model of people living 100% raw. So, I mean, I was, I was breaking new ground as it was. Um, and partly I didn't want to go raw for a lot of that time. I, I didn't know when I made diet changes that they were leading me towards going raw until, you know, that was the last step. <laughs> and, and so I made a whole bunch of other changes, not, not knowing where I was heading, let alone low fat, raw, vegan, um, you know, mono meals as the predominant thing. And um, I didn't want any of that. And, and, and now it's not that I want it or don't want it. I want my health. I want my mental clarity. I want my weight management. I want my fitness performance. I want my recall of words. I want my, my quick recovery from exertions. I want to be able to go out and still go ice skating with my daughter. I want to, um, you know, be able to do things. I want to be in demand from, from clients and athletes and whoever, uh, because they know that I can still be valuable to them. I, I can be a useful part of society and not a, a drain on society being carried along by, don't ask me who it is that's going to carry me along. I, I don't know. But even then, I, I don't want to be that person. I, I really enjoy being productive and being useful and being a necessary part of other people's lives. So for all of those reasons, rather than, hey, you know, I, I want to be a low fat raw vegan, uh, it, that, that really isn't the, the driving thing, the thing. And nor do I think that it'll be a sufficient thing 
for many people, I've seen lots and lots of people tell me they want to, they say, I want to do this thing, you know, and I go, okay, well, why? And they go, well, you know, I read your book, I want to do it, it makes sense. Yeah, okay, but I hope you have a lot stronger reasons than that. So it's that time of year where we start looking at those reasons, making commitments, resolving to improve yourself, to be a better person, to, to reach your goals, whatever they might be, to, to grow as an individual, to, to become. You know, the tree that doesn't grow for a whole year dies. One year of no growth. I mean, I don't think it's any different for a person. If you go through a year with no growth, somebody was telling me the other day how much they've been trying to reduce the stress in their life. They want to get rid of the stress. And I'm going like, stress is the best thing ever. With, without stress, there's no strength. You can't develop strength, any kind of strength, without the stress that calls for the development of that strength, whether that's physical, emotional, chemical, the ability to sit down and you know, type away at a computer, whatever the stress, uh, dealing with other people. So obviously more stress than you can handle is a problem, <clears throat> but having no stress, life would be, life would be totally uninteresting. You'd become a weakling. And, and I don't see it. That's not a life. That's not, that's not how you live a productive, useful, helpful, incorporated into society kind of a person. So we're going to narrow in. Let's focus in some of that um, thought process into topics for tonight, uh, which start out with cravings. Now, Cravings is the coolest word. I just, I, I get a tickle out of that word sometimes. And um, because so many people tell me, you know, I listen to my body. I like to listen to my body. Uh, my body said one thing, my mind said another. Um, I decided to become a raw vegan, but then my body said it needed coffee and cookies. Um, you know, and I listen to my body and I go, well, yeah, but that wasn't your body talking. Your body wasn't craving coffee and cookies because every cell of your body is designed to thrive. This is critically important concept to utilize in all decision-making. Every cell, in fact, every organelle, within every cell. So if we say there's a couple of thousand organelles inside of every hundred trillion cells, I don't know where that gets us. Um, quintillions of, of functioning parts inside of us. And every single one is not only designed to thrive, but to seek to thrive. So every tissue, every organ, every organ system, and every organism, including us, are designed to seek to thrive. And when we understand that, it gives us a, a powerful tool, a powerful understanding uh, that we can utilize when we talk to ourselves and when we talk to others and people say, well, yeah, but, but I was craving coffee. Well, coffee's pretty hard on your health. Coffee's definitely detrimental to your health. Does it have anything good in it? Of course, it's got a, you know, it's got a hundred thousand nutrients in there or a hundred thousand chemical substances in there. And some of them, are good for us, some of them are necessary for us, but a whole bunch of them are really harmful. Now, T.C. Fry taught me a concept that, that he called the golden rule of eating. And he said that the golden rule of eating was that 
above all, thou shalt not harm thyself. At the time I was, I was going through my medical training, actually, I just gotten out of my medical training, you know, where the, where the Hippocratic oath, short form of the Hippocratic oath is, thou shalt do no harm. Um, which was kind of interesting how well that fit in with a vegan concept of ahimsa, of doing no harm. It surprises me that more doctors aren't vegan. Doesn't that surprise you? The two seem to fit together. But, but the idea is that it's not that the people will say sometimes that the, the risk outweighs the benefits. But yeah, but above all, do no harm. Figuring that out on a societal scale can create some ethical discussions or room for some ethical discussions. Is it better to harm 100 people to save 100,000? I'm glad I don't have to make these decisions because for me, it was as simple as above all, do no harm. If I'm, if I'm above all trying to do no harm and my body wants me to do no harm to it and coffee has a bunch of harmful substances in it, it's not only illogical, it's philosophically impossible for your body to crave coffee or any other toxic substance whether that be an addictive drug or a recreational drug or any other addictive substance. Is it possible for your mind to seek a certain feeling or emotion that you experienced when you utilized the substance? Well, yeah, that's possible. But your body can't. Your body can't. As far as I understand it, it is anatomically, physiologically impossible to crave something that's harmful to you. Physically crave. And yet we've all had cravings and we've certainly all had cravings for various foods. And what I experienced was an odd, I, I thought it was odd. I grew up snacking a lot. I mean, like a lot as an athlete boy growing like crazy, putting on 30 and 40 pounds over a summer on occasion. Um, doing sport from morning till night and loving every minute of it. Uh, eating four and 5,000 calories a day was not a big deal to me. And I wasn't getting all that at mealtime. So I was snacking constantly. And, and there were so many times where I would just like look in the closet or look in the freezer or look in the fridge to see if there was something that would satisfy me because I didn't want just anything. I wanted something specific. Now, if you were hungry, you'll eat anything. But when you're craving you're craving something very specific. Oh, you know, how about a cup of tea? No, I want coffee. I mean, that's very specific. That's not just thirsty. Um, you know, that's, that's a very specific way of looking at things. Now, we, we use the word craving, understanding that it's, it's related to the, the past tense sort of is craving. You know, a person is craving, but, but the people who have cravings that we 
look down upon those are the people who have drug cravings you know they're craving their next fix um odd that we don't have that same live on the street mentality when you're craving your next chocolate filled bavarian cream filled donut or something um we use the same word, but we don't relate it in the same way to that, to that addict. We don't think of cravings as the nice word for addicted to. Uh, in the same way, we don't think of hungry as the nice word for cravings. Because they're really not even hungry they're addicted to. It's very specific. Offer the hungry person a leaf of lettuce and they probably won't take it because they're not hungry for lettuce. They're hungry for something else, something specific. And you know, I've often I've often told the story of my daughter who when I gave her her first grape ever, she gave it back to me. She put it in her mouth, swirled it around, gave it back to me and said, it's not food um, until I peeled it. And then it was glistening with that lovely glucose rich grape liquid. And then when she put it in her mouth, she tasted the sweetness and right away bit down on it and got more sweetness and understood that she, you know, that it really was food because what she was looking for in food was sweetness, as are we all. For kids, you know, they have mi a milk tooth, but the only tooth that you hear adults trying to control is their sweet tooth. Now, I think it's funny that you would want to control your sweet tooth or not give in to your sweet tooth when it's telling you what you're looking for. And so if you don't give in to your sweet tooth and give it plenty of fruits, then you're still looking for those sweets somewhere, somehow, because most of the calories used in our body are used in the form of carbohydrates. Simple carbohydrates, specifically glucose and fructose, and anything else we eat has to be converted into that. If it's going to make its way into our bloodstream, make its way into our muscles, make its way to our organs to be used as fuel. So when it boils down that almost all the cravings are cravings to satisfy our sweet tooth, we can go about this two ways. We could say, well, eat enough fruit so you never experience cravings. Or here's the cravings you're likely to have. If this ever happens to you, let it be a wake-up call that you need to eat more fruit, either before the meal or at the next meal or as a general rule, that the fruit you're choosing isn't sweet enough. If you're trying to maintain your weight, well, you might have a, a nice variety of fruits. Um, if you're trying to lose weight, you might stick with the fruits that are not as dense, that are not as sweet. If you're trying to gain weight, you need to eat the sweeter fruits because the less sweet ones just won't give you enough the volume is there because they're not giving you a lot of sugar. So you're getting fiber, you're getting water, you're getting other things. And it could be a very big piece of fruit, but it's not very, not very sugar rich, uh, not very glucose rich. And you just won't, I mean, you can eat a ton of it, but you won't gain. Uh, certainly help plenty of people who were gaining weight and didn't want to by, hey, you know what? How about if you don't have bananas for lunch? How about if you have almost anything else? <laughs> have grapes, have peaches, <clears throat> you know, have, have citrus, have berries, have almost anything else. And 
all of a sudden you go, okay, now I can lose because those bananas are dense. <clears throat> it's a lot of calories and makes gaining easy, makes maintaining easy, but it doesn't make for easy losses. <clears throat> if you're craving sweets at the end of the meal, you didn't eat enough fruit before the meal. It, that's probably obvious. But it takes practice to know how much fruit. So I usually take some oranges and juice them. When I can, I'll take tangerines or clementines or nardicots or something sweeter, honey bell. So it depends on what's in season, but I'll go for the sweetest citrus I can find and I'll juice it. I'll add mango to that and blend it and then have two, two liters of that before my dinner, usually. But if it's been a big day of exercise, I might have three liters of that. Um, let's, let's just figure liters and quarts are almost the same thing for those of you on different systems. And, and I don't think twice about that because I know that if I just have one, the end of the meal, I'm going to be looking around for something rich. It's just where I am driven. And I start looking for something rich. I go, oh, you know, maybe maybe some almonds might be nice. A handful of almonds. Um, oh, you know what? Let me just sit down with the jar of almonds and I'll start eating. Uh, not a good plan and not something I want to have happen to me. But it had to happen a lot of times before I realized that I need to eat enough fruit, like, like really, really eat a lot of fruit, a lot of fruit. It was just, it, I don't know, maybe I sound like a repeated record sometimes, but you, if it's not enough, there will be a problem. You're gonna crave or you're gonna drop weight. Something's not gonna work. And, <clears throat> There are nights where I go, oh man, let me just get to the salad. I really want the salad. And I'm tempted to not have any fruit at all. But then after the salad, I'm not done. I'm not finished. I'm not satiated. And if you're craving sweets after the meal or in between meals, if you're, if you're craving something heavy, um, you know, if, if candy, alcohol, chocolate, dried fruit, any of that stuff starts calling your name, you're not eating enough fresh fruit. Interesting, we know from experience that if we don't eat enough fruit, we can still get carbohydrates from complex carbs. That's in our history. We can still eat complex carbs. And if you've read my little booklet, Grain Damage, uh, I had a copy here. If you've read my little book with grain damage, ah, oh, here it is. Is it coming? No, it's hiding. <laughs> oh, maybe like that. Is it there now? Now I can't see it, but I'm gonna guess it's there instead of my face. Um, if you haven't read grain damage, I, I urge you to do so. But if you have read grain damage, you know that I kind of think of starchy foods as just paste. It's just paste. Like, like I watched some guys hanging wallpaper and they were using starch and water. That's all they were using. It's called wallpaper paste. It's just starch and water. Uh, the paste that they use in, in schools, that, that white school paste, that has mint added to it very often and sometimes even salt. But... It's still just starch and water for the most part. Um, if starches are calling your name, whether that's bread, rice, pasta, corn, oats, legumes, vegetables that you have to cook in order to eat them, starchy vegetables, if starches are calling you, you're just not eating enough fruit. Now, this time of year, especially as the cold comes on, 
um, as the harvests, the summer harvests wane, a lot of people have trouble with this time of year. They're going, oh man, I just can't, like the fruit quality is going down so quickly that I can't seem to meet my calorie needs anymore. And I have to go to cook food. And I'm going, no, you don't. You just need to eat the right stuff and be aware, which we'll talk about in the next section. But, but certainly now we want to um, think, well, what's, what's around that, that could do that? Um, you know, what's, what's really good. You won't always find it in the, when I go in a grocery store, I'm shocked that when I go to a local street market, I see way more and way better fruit in the local, sh in the local street market than I do in a grocery store. Like how can the street markets beat the big guys? Well, the big guys don't really care to sell you great fruit. That's, that's not a money maker for them. Um, they just have to carry it because they have to, but they, they're not sourcing the really great stuff. And, and I'm just shocked every time that the, gro that the grocery store is beat, not only price-wise, but quality-wise and variety-wise. So there's only one other craving possible, and that's a craving for something salty. Uh, and that's a rare craving, craving for something salty. But people do have it. And if you're craving something salty, it's a surefire bet you haven't been eating enough vegetables and you just need to increase the vegetables in your diet. You don't need to go crazy, but you need to increase a bit. People all the time say, do you just eat fruit? I go, no, I eat lots of vegetables too. I mean, if, if I put my fruits and vegetables side by side in terms of volume, unprepped volume, uh, it's probably 50-50. But then again, it depends on whether you call the tomato a fruit or a vegetable, the cucumber a fruit or a vegetable. And that's an argument for another day, but I, I use our culinary use. So I'm thinking of fruit, cucumbers and tomatoes as a vegetable because in the kitchen, that's how I use them. I, cravings are funny stuff. You know, I, I, don't, I don't get judgmental about it. People definitely do have them. But we want to use our cravings as a learning experience. We want to learn them. We want to use them rather um, as like warning signs on the uh, rails, rails, guardrails on the side of the road, warning signs. Oh, I'm starting to experience cravings. I need to do something about that. What do I need to do? It's almost always eat more fruit before the meal. Last night I, I had company over and and we, I had made this incredible fruit cocktail. I was really happy with this fruit cocktail. And our guest loved it, just loved it, chowed down on the fruit cocktail. But after she was done, she goes, I don't really want much salad. I'm, I mean, I'm full. And I go, that's the idea. If you fill up on fruit, you'll still want your vegetables. Let's just wait a few minutes. Let's, you know, we'll go out in the living room and talk for a little bit or if it had been nicer out, gone outside, but it was pouring rain. But, uh, you know, go outside and, and just walk for 10 or 15 minutes and enjoy the, enjoy the onset of evening, whatever it was. But eating so much fruit that you're not even really looking for much in the world of vegetables on that particular day, that beats the heck out of craving at the end of the meal. You don't want to be driven you want to be driving. And, and for most folks who, who aren't getting enough carbs anyway from fruit, having that meal where you go, oh, you know, I'm, I'm not even looking for that much salad. Okay, great. Tomorrow, your muscle glycogen levels will be a bit fuller and you won't be so tempted. You won't feel the urge to eat quite so much fruit. And that's perfectly all right because you've, you know, you've filled the need and then, and then you'll find that balance, but it beats the heck out of, out of not eating enough fruit. So that's a long time talking about it, but it's, it's a super important thing to me. Uh, one of the ways 
that I utilize to not only maximize nutrition, although I don't worry about that at all, but not only to maximize nutrition, but also to maximize my enjoyment of my food is to eat variety during the course of the year. I eat a wide variety of fruits during the course of the year, a huge variety of vegetables during the course of the year, not at any given meal. Keep my meals very simple, but in the course of a year, huge variety in overall fruit and vegetable choices. This month, you know, I'm eating persimmon because it's persimmon season and most of the world has available persimmon. Um, if they're gonna have it, it's gonna be in December. Now, some years you might get lucky. Uh, the old saying was you buy persimmon at Thanksgiving and, and eat them at Christmas. Um, that's changed a little bit as persimmon have become more readily available. A lot of times you'll see persimmon um, by the beginning of November and sometimes even the end of October, depends on how last year's season affected this year's crops. Uh, usually persimmon season ends right around Christmas, but some years, and especially more often these days, you might see persimmon in the stores all the way until the beginning of February. Either way, it's a pretty short window of, of seeing and eating persimmon, and I recommend you take advantage of them. Eat persimmon. They're sweet, they're juicy, they've got all the right things going for them. And they take the they take a big bite out of the beginning of winter to take the pressure off relying upon bananas or take the pressure off relying upon all that stone fruit that you were eating in the summertime. And, and you go, ah. It's persimmon. For me, this is easy. For you, maybe not. But you should be able to think month by month what's available and already know now that October was just so rich in grapes and November so rich in pears, and December so rich in persimmon, and September so rich in blueberries and apples. And whether you go forward into the calendar or backward through the calendar, and which kind of citrus, and when are you going to see those honey bells, and when are you going to see the best grapefruits, that, the ones you really like, and when are you going to see the next berries? I mean, you might might not really see berries till April. Could be April before you start seeing berries again. And, and on and on through all the different months, you go, wow, what's in season now? Oh, it's February, it's tangerines, yippee. You know, and take advantage of the massive variety that's available to us. And, and very much so the same way with vegetables. There are vegetables that are definitely summer crops. There's vegetables that are definitely springtime crops. Uh, and there are vegetables that are definitely primarily autumn crops. And a few that are more common winter crops than any other veggies. So as you become aware of which, and then start to understand what to go after, what to look for. I mean, if I'm looking for Brussels sprouts in the height of summer, um, A, I probably won't even find them, but B, if I do, they're not gonna be very good. It's just not gonna happen, you know, that way. And, uh, or, or if I do find them, they came from halfway around the world from the other side of the equator. And, and I mean, they had, it, it was a long time ago since they were picked, so. I personally want to know what's happening now, what's really in season now, um, and utilize and take advantage of those things, because I don't want to miss a fig season or a persimmon season or a lychee season. Um, I don't want to miss those things 
when they come and they're only three or four weeks long and and then they're gone and, and it's going to be another whole year before I see them again. Oh, that would be bad. So I want to make sure I cash in on that. I want to know that nuts fall off trees in the autumn. And if I want the very, very best nuts, it's going to be late autumn, early winter when I'm, when I'm finding the very best nuts and, and seeds come a little earlier and da, 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 da through, through fruit after through, through vegetable after vegetable. When is it going to be of most peak flavor, which tends to be when it's also at lowest cost uh, and you're getting the best product. So for me, variety ensures nutritional sufficiency. In case you're worried, I'm not. I think we would do just just fine eating a very, very simple diet where very few foods were available to us. <clears throat> but I don't want to find out and I don't want to push that limit and I don't want to find out how far you can go before something bad happens. Uh, and all of the knowledge that I've accumulated over the years of nutrition tell me that that variety ensures nutritional sufficiency. It's not that there's different nutrients so much as different concentrations of nutrients in different foods. So if I wanna get the most nutrition out of the food I eat, then I need to eat food that's, that's biologically compatible, that has good food combining, that uh, perhaps actually is a mono meal so that I can really pet, you know, my body can work with it one thing at a time at its very, very best. Um, and, and simplicity really makes for that availability of, of foods, nutri nutrients in foods. But variety ensures and guarantees your, your sufficiency throughout the year. So while you're focusing in January on this and it gets a, a fantastic amount of this uh, in June, you can be eating some completely different foods and they get you other nutrient, um, not again, as I said, not different nutrients, but just different concentrations so that we have what we think of as nutri nutrient sufficiency. Uh, we don't need really more than sufficient. Just like on your medical exams, if you have blood work or lab work done of any kind, they don't say that you're either deficient or sufficient. They say you're either deficient, sufficient, or you're in excess. And it is certainly possible to be in excess. Once again, if, if all you eat is papaya, day in, day out, year round, and you come to me with yellow palms and yellow feet and your arms are turning yellow and, and you go, how come you know my skin's turning yellow? And I'm going, well, you can't just live on papaya. I mean, there's so much, um, phytonutrients of that color, that orangey, yellowy, um, some people's skin goes more yellow, some goes more orange, but uh, either way, like the phytonutrients in there that cause this, the, the A derivatives, <clears throat> come on, what do you expect? We want to have variety throughout the year. I like papaya as much as the next guy, but I don't want to live on it day in and day out all year round because it won't work. I'm getting all the nutrients, but in one specific concentration dose, uh, one specific ratio dose. We don't want that. You want to supply nutritional sufficiency. You eat variety throughout the year. Um, if you want, and I'm, I'm sure hoping people want what they consider to be a success with their diet. Uh, hang around with the people who are having success. Hang around with the successful people. 
try what they do for a while. I've had lots of people tell me, they'll come to a retreat and say, well, you know, I usually eat fruit at night and vegetables in the midday and will that work? And I go, well, yeah, it might, but as long as you're here, why don't you try it my way while you're here and see if you like the way we do things where we, we eat a, I eat three big meals, right? And so my big meal in the morning is a, is a juicy water rich meal. And my big meal in the midday is a, is a rich carbohydrate, rich, dense calorie meal. And, and my big meal in the evening is, is I like to have enough volume so that I feel satisfied. And so my, my dinner salad gives me lots of volume and I get to a point where I go, ah, and that's a big meal too. So I'm having three big meals a day, um, but each is big in different things. In one case, I'm making sure I'm getting hydrated. In one case, I'm making sure I get enough carbohydrates. In one case, I'm getting enough volume. So I feel like I've eaten something and I'm not just looking around for something to fill my tummy. Hang around with people who are succeeding. Try what they're doing. Uh, read books and tapes and programs from the people who are succeeding. Um, make the commitment to yourself that you intend to succeed. It's not just, oh, I want to succeed, but, but really there's no other option but success. And I'm going to keep doing, it doesn't, I mean, look, even the most successful of all the boxers in the world occasionally get knocked to the canvas, but the successful ones get back up and continue. And I, I fully endorse you trying enough things so occasionally you don't get it right. That's okay. Just get up off the canvas and keep up the good fight as they call it. Um, you know, make that commitment that you're going to try again and again and again until you get it right. Because success is a decision. Success is a decision. Um, failure is a part of success. Failure is what success is built upon. Uh, you know, you look at Edison trying thousands and thousands of different filaments for his light bulb, none of which worked until he finally found something that worked. And, and he considered every failure a step closer to success. So do I. Uh, I, was, I was in an event called a Tough Mudder one time. And Tough Mudder was not that tough, but it, it was good. And, and there were signs all along the course. And one of the signs said, failure is temporary. Quitting is permanent. So I encourage you, you know, if you occasionally have failures, that's okay. Just get back up, learn from your failure and continue. Uh, quitting, quitting is not an option in my world. Quitting simply isn't, isn't who I am. Um, and I hope it's not who you are either. I hope, I hope that no matter what stumbling blocks you've run across, no matter how many false starts you've made, uh, no matter how many times you've said, okay, I'm going to go raw now and, and found next thing you know, you found yourself eating cooked again. That's all okay. Because we all have to go through those challenges. We all have to find out why is it? Why are we here? What are we really trying to get done? Um, and once you have that, that commitment to success, that, that, there really isn't going to be another way. It's going to be success. Then, you know, but hang with the people who have already succeeded. I mean, I'm going to Costa Rica. My staff member has been with me since 1988. And, um, and she is succeeding wildly. I mean, her physique, her sports performance, her, her ability to express herself, her, her, expertise in the kitchen is is really second to none and and i'm i'm just impressed as all heck and when our guests come to spend time with us and go wow you know just between between the two of you you've got almost 80 years worth of raw food success behind you you must have seen some failures too and you go, yeah lots of failures learned from them now here's what we're doing that's been succeeding and succeeding and succeeding, you know, for 25, 30 years. 
and and no looking back because what we're doing is working. So you just keep working it once you get there. But until then, so you have some struggles. Good for you. That's how you grow. Those stresses result in strength. Okay, so you're just you're just challenging yourself to grow through your own your own. I mean, some people don't like the word failure. Some people don't like the word obstacles. I don't really see any of those in my world. I pay no attention to obstacles. I pay no attention to failures. Um, I've got my eye on the goal, the successes that are going to happen. And it really doesn't matter. I had something I needed to get done this week and, and yesterday finally got it done. But I had a false start. I thought I was going to do it 10 days ago. And every day for 10 days, I got started and then got thwarted. And okay, I mean, I just, it just didn't mean anything to me. I didn't pay any attention that all I wanted was to get the job done so sometimes you just have to think do you want to get the job done or do you want to pay attention to the challenge because I think when you pay attention to the challenge that's all you see that's what that's what becomes you know the only thing you see uh, there's an expression in snow skiing that they call skiing the trees which I think is a very funny expression. You know, you go off the main trails, you go off piste, and then you go ski the trees through the woods. And, and, and I think that's just a very funny expression because on a bicycle, if you're going to bicycle between two posts that are pretty narrow and you still have to bicycle through them, you don't look at them. You look at the space between them because object fixation says that if you're looking at them, that's where you're going to turn the wheel towards, and that's where you're going to go. You don't want to ski the trees. You want to ski the spaces between the trees. And when you're eating your raw food, let's pay attention to eating raw food. The people tell me, oh, I'm weaning myself off. I'm going, why are you still sticking to that cooked food? It's not helping you go raw. If you want to succeed at eating raw, the way to do it is to eat raw. It's coming up to New Year's, folks. Make some resolutions. The way to succeed at eating raw is to eat more raw. Until there's no more that you want to eat, until that's all you do eat. And all of a sudden you go, wow, I look in the mirror and a raw foodist looks back at me. Wouldn't that be cool? Um, until the raw, the raw foodist looks back at you, you're going to keep going back to cooked. So make some decisions about what you want. I think not based on the food. I think based on how you want to feel. Do you want to, do you want to feel the energy? Do you want to feel the clarity? Do you want to feel the, the energy of health? Do you want to be seeing health in all your decision making? Do you want to feel the motivation do you want to feel that the oh the 20 to 25 percent less sleep required that happens when you go all raw i mean for me that's enough just that extra add an extra two hours or three hours into my day well two hours of sleep time that i lose you know two but it adds two to three hours in my productive day and i'm just going wow that's a big deal that's a lot in and of itself i want that and i go how do i go after that i go after that by eating fruits and vegetables it's not about the fruits and vegetables it's what do you want in your life you know do you want to have the weight management do you want to have the energy do you want to have the clarity of mind do you want to have the clear skin and white eyes and good teeth and and all the things that go with eating raw. Do you want those things? Okay, well, the way to get that is to do this. And, and that works That works for me. People tell me, oh, it's all about willpower. And I go, no, no willpower required. Go after what you want. That's it for today. Go after what you want.